I would like to thank you first for your report, which takes on board many of ACRE's recommendations. So that's good to hear. My name is uh, Anne Batili. I work in Brussels at the European Council on Refugees and Exiles, which is an um, umbrella organization with uh, members in all over Europe, but also Ukraine, Turkey. Um, I, mean, I was invited to actually comment uh, this uh, study and the topic of this conference and to bring an uh, EU perspective from an NGO, of course, of how the EU level is defining or clarifying the rights to integration, if I would say it like that, at the moment. And I think it's also quite important to, to get this study right now because the um, common European asylum system, which is the, uh, the, the package of directives, legislation for asylum, is coming to the end, I think, this year. I say I think because some of the directives were um, uh, reformulated and not formally adopted by the Council, but that, I mean, 2013 should be the last year. And which means that in the next years, the European Commission will have to monitor what's going on in member states. Uh, if member states do uh, apply and have correctly implemented the directives, um, so all information, uh, evidence on how uh, is the situation at the local or national level is of course um, evidence organization but also the European Commission is willing to take on board. Um, monitoring as this study shows is not only to check if member states uh, do comply with their international European uh, obligations, but it's also a way to show how things can be improved and uh, with some, um, what kind of partnerships or programs need needs to be in place to improve the situation. I will begin first with, I don't have any, yeah, that will be the only page you will see. I don't have any PowerPoint, but it, it's going to be brief. Um, I, I will update what's going on, what kind of legislative change is happening now at the EU level, and not only actually regarding the reception condition directive, but as you know, integration is a multi-dimensional phenomenon. So I would like also to say a few words about the asylum procedure directive, and I will um, explain uh, why, but also the qualification directive, which is very important for the integration of refugees and beneficiaries of subsidiary protection. And also something more uncovered, but which will be very important in the future, and that is the new fund at the European level called Asylum and Migration Fund. So first of all, uh, the new reception condition directive uh, is almost at the <coughs> end, which means that the European Parliament and the Council have completed the negotiations into late uh, in, in December uh, 2012 but the European Council has not uh, adopted formally the new directive. And one of the reasons is, might be or is, that uh, the European Council would like to uh, put pressure on the European Parliament uh, for other proposals on the table, and specifically Eurodac. Eurodac is the European database uh, um, of asylum seekers' fingerprints. And the reason why I'm saying that is that um, it actually gives you an insight of what are the priorities at the EU level. And for, s for sure, the priorities are not reception, the quality or the standards of reception conditions, but more um, uh, Eurodac, Eurosur, uh, Frontex and the budget for uh, external dimension. Secondly, the Asylum Procedure Directive, 
uh, there has been some uh, uh, amendments and these amendments are still under negotiation, but like for a reception condition directive, this directive should be formally adopted this year. The qualification directive was adopted in 2011, which means that member states have until the end of this year to uh, transpose this directive in their national legislation. And at least but not last, uh, the regulation for asylum and migration fund and negotiations for this fund have started uh, between the European Parliament and the, uh, the Council. Um, normally, again, an adoption should be, uh, uh, should, be uh, ha should happen in 2013. But of course, if there's if an overall agreement on the EU budget is reached. The question I'll take for this uh, comment is, uh, from an EU perspective, are refugees and uh, asylum seekers entitled or subjects for integration? If we take uh, the case for uh, people who were granted a status, um, then we have to look at the qualification directive. And already, if you read the qualification directive in the preamble, uh, it's very clear that this directive acknowledges um, not only the importance of integration, but also the fact that integration that member states have to comply with international obligations. Uh, and the qualification directive defines the, the rights refugees and beneficiaries of, pro of subsidiary protection have with regards to access to employment, social welfare, health care, and access to so-called integration facilities. So it recognizes the importance and the, uh, um, the legal basis of, of these rights, but also the specificity of these groups and the specificity of refugee groups is anchored in different directives of course following international <coughs> sorry <laughs> um, and it says clearly that member states have to take into account specific needs so for instance member states should address problems uh, which prevent beneficiaries of international protection from having effective access to employment related educational opportunities and vocational training. Another example is that uh, member states should address the problem of recognition of qualification. Uh, I would like to nuance uh, this, uh, this um, clarification anchored in the, in the qualification directive because the qualification directive, even though it aligns the rights of refugees and beneficiaries of protection, um, uh, subsidiary protection, it still um, includes a difference between these two groups. So for instance, uh, beneficiaries of subsidiary protection uh, would have uh, different rights regarding the residence permit, the duration of the residence permit, but also the access to the labour market. And this distinction between these two groups is, um, is also clear in the Family Reunification Directive, which excludes from its scope, the uh, beneficiaries of subsidiary protection. And the reason why I'm mentioning that is that uh, the, the report of uh, uh, Professor Sudkwa, sorry, to, um, was very interesting in really um, uh, uh, repeating or insisting on the multidimensional aspect of integration and the fact that if people are separated, do not have access to family reunification or access to housing, then of course the integration path becomes very difficult. So then for asylum seekers, that's of course totally a different story. Then we have to look at the recast, which is the new reception condition directive. 
They are mainly two articles. One that has not changed, actually, Article 14, about schooling and education of minors, and which states that minors uh, should have uh, access to education under the sim similar condition as nationals. So, no change. But then we go to Article 15, and there's a new thing, subparagraph 1 and 2. The first paragraph says that member states shall ensure that applicants have access to the labour market no later than nine months following date, the date of application. We advocated for six months delay, and it was also in the, uh, the proposal of the Commission, but the Council extended this delay. And then this article adds that, um, so they should have access no later than nine months, and if the delay in the procedure cannot be attributed to the applicant. And that's an important element because it leads us to the asylum procedure directive, which is also under negotiation. And uh, this provision reintroduces the possibility to extend the period during which uh, an asylum seeker can be denied access to the labour market to one year. In two situations referred to the asylum procedure directive. So to, in other words, uh, this article actually makes the link between the extension of time limit for the asylum procedure and the access to the labour market. And without clearly defining actually what is the, what will be the failure, what will be considered as the failure of the applicant to comply with, the, um, with his or her obligation. And that's, of course, a very important element because that means that in practice, um, not only there can be an extension of this uh, denial to the labour market, but also more conditions for people to have access to the labour market. So that's it for the bad news. Uh, there's a slight improvement in the reception condition directive, which is the second paragraph of this article. And there's a new wording um, which was included in this, in this article. And it says that uh, member states uh, shall decide the conditions for granting access to the labour market for the applicants in accordance with their national law while, and it's important, while ensuring asylum seekers have effective access to the labour market. And this new wording actually uh, implies a positive obligation uh, for member states to ensure effective access to the labour market. And so that's for us, for you it might be a <laughs> Uh, the minimal uh, improvement, but for us it's still uh, an improvement because it means that <coughs> if a member state applies or uh, introduces many obstacles for this access, then it doesn't comply with the directive. <coughs> and then uh, the last thing is the new asylum and migration funds. Um, so you had at the European level, you had different funds. Uh, the integration fund, um, which was targeting only um, migrants or economical migrants. And then you had the uh, European Refugee Fund, the Return Fund. And now the, uh, the Commission's proposal uh, merged the Return Fund, the Integration Fund and the Refugee Fund into one fund called the Asylum and Migration Fund. And um, the, the NGOs actually welcomed uh, this merging because one of the reasons the European Commission said is that um, that would address actually the, the differentiation between groups if I'm talking about integration, like more concretely, an NGO or a local authority is implementing an integration programs, previously could not uh, accept 
uh, asylum seekers or refugees if it, if it was funded by the integration fund. So this new fund would be would have been the possibility to to actually offer services regarding people needs and not people legal status. Well, uh, it seems that it will be a dream because the European Parliament followed uh, this proposal, but the European Council uh, steps back from the Commission's proposal and introduced a May clause, which actually say that Member States can, of course, uh, do differently, but, uh, but tends to exclude asylum seekers from integration policies programs funded by uh, this new fund. And I think it reflects what was said today, uh, but at the European level, for sure, and it's not new, asylum seekers are not uh, entitled to integration. I mean, are not um, spoken into integration terms, because this is supposed to be temporary, and they can integrate only uh, when their uh, status is granted. And um, uh, I think that there's two things. I mean, a final thing I'd like to add is that uh, integration was never really uh, uh, defined at EU level only for um, refugees or, I mean, in their specificity of these groups. And so I think it's very important to see the general discourse on integration. And there has been a shift between uh, what was supposed to be integration measures uh, supposed to support and facilitate integration and social inclusion to what is now more and more uh, used, the term is more and more used, as integration requirements. Uh, so people are required to integrate and for to in order to integrate they have to fulfill certain requirements. We have that in the family reunification policies but also access, I mean other areas linked to integration and and for sure until now refugees and beneficiaries of international protection to some extent are protected from these integration requirements but that's the discourse and for sure asylum seekers are excluded from the uh, this protection um, so as usual <laughs> I finish with a very depressing note <laughs> when I talk about the EU <coughs> level. Uh, but maybe, and, and that's why for me this conference and this report is, is quite interesting, is that in this field, uh, the European, um, the EU level will not be an actor of change <laughs> for change. Uh, but when we look at the practices at local level from municipalities, local authorities, um, it might actually, the, these actors might actually push for some legislative change. As you finished the report on uh, about Hamburg, the situation in Hamburg, and that the municipality could push for uh, changes at the federal level. And and maybe the, the change will, will come from, from this level. But do not expect anything <laughs> from, this, uh, from the EU level. Thank you very much. <laughs>